From the Woodshed, a casual conversation with Chase Morrill and Ryan Eldridge of Kennebec Cabin Company, the team that inspired the hit show Maine Cabin Masters. From the Woodshed is brought to you by Nelma. See the stamp, trust the quality. By Hammond Lumber, your building project partner. By Kennebec Savings Bank, helping our local community save, thrive, and grow for over 150 years. And by Hero Media Network, connecting small business with new customers. Now, from the Woodshed Studios in Manchester, Maine, it's Chase and Ryan. From the Woodshed, I'm Chase Morrill. With me as always, it's Ryan Eldridge, Maggie Morrill. Hi. We're here, about, we're here to talk about all things Maine, all things cabins, all things Maine cabin related. And foreign countries today. And foreign countries today and dogs. Love them. Our guest today is Craig and Fred, the Afghan dog. It's a pretty amazing story, so stay tuned for that. You can find out more about us at KennebecCabinCompany.com, MainCabinMasters.com, Facebook, Instagram, Kennebec Cabin YouTube channel. Check out our online store at shop.kennebeccabincompany.com. And we can't do this without our sponsors, Nelma, Northeast Lumber Manufacturing Association, Hero Media Arts Network, connecting small businesses with new customers, Hammond Lumber Company, the official building materials supplier of Kennebec Cabin Company, Kennebec Savings Bank, helping our local community save thrive and grow for over 150 years i always want to take a drink of water for your dad when he's doing that <laughs> and we always we also want to thank our fans for tuning yes, in yes thank listening, you listening watching the show sending in your questions we wouldn't be here without you so thank you for that and they're still coming into our worldwide headquarters yes and it's getting cold out it is getting too cold out today t- so today i brought my sister to the airport at 4 a.m is she I going walked, back to Hawaii? They're back in Hawaii. They might even be there by now. Smart, smart, smart. I went outside. It was not even frost. It was like a thick layer of... I couldn't believe how thick it was. I don't think I've ever seen frost that thick. Yeah. I went outside this morning. I was doing some stuff. I'm like, I can't do this. Turn around, went inside, put on my <laughs> long underwear. But it's a lot... It's a way past last year. It's true. It's true. I mean, we're after Halloween, so we've been very fortunate. We had a good October. But... It gets so I'm on to my I'm on to my upper long johns. I haven't gone in the lowers yet. Oh, I, I did. Today. Did you go all in? Oh my god! Up and bottoms? Just bottoms. Oh really? So I go just tops first. Really? Well, because my pants don't stay on my butt, so yeah, I, yeah, if I go yeah, tops yeah. first, it kind of holds the, yeah. that air gap. Interesting, huh? Yeah. Which way do you go, Maggie? Neither. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Nori's. Probably... What about you over there, Jen? You wearing no, your long underwear? Much. I can't handle. I can't handle. It's the smart. Layers. Oh, oh no! I mean, I got to. There's I'm nothing better. Or something, I'll wear them. But yeah. Technology has made like... working outside great. Remember working yeah. with the waffle yes. stuff? Yes. I get my Under Armour now, but now I'm on Helly Hansen. Like, yeah. get that on. It's so skin tight. Like, I feel warm and cozy. Like, I'm pretty sure Uncle Lee wears his waffle long underwear year round. <laughs> and the union suit. It's brown. Actually, Jen, my sister quoted you today. What did she say about you? What did she say about the weather? Come on, come on. There's no such thing as bad weather. Only the wrong clothing. Yep, which is right these days. That's yeah. why I have like 10 down jackets and boots for every depth of snow. Unless you're in Hawaii and half naked like she is the whole time running around. Yeah. No wonder she said that. But it's that time of year where like it's just cold and, you know, it's you're putting everything away, getting ready for the snow. It's not my favorite time of the year. This is my least favorite time of the year. It's my birthday month and I hate it. Yeah. I hate it. The days are getting short. Like, yeah. I was driving down there this morning. Fourth, like, if this was June, the sun would be up right now. I'd be like, yeah, let's take on the day. Yeah. I guess dark out right now. I know. So let's mm-hmm. not talk about it. But that's all right. Just wait till we set the clocks back. And Maggie's got some big stories to share. Do I? Yeah. Yeah, you've been on tour. I love oh, it. Oh yeah. I forgot. I forget what's been happening. How was the Harry Styles concert? It I was ca- incredible. I called the opener. <laughs> no, you didn't. I tried to. <laughs> Maggie made it down to Boston to see Harry Styles. Girls trip. Yep. They drove down for the night. Yeah. So I couldn't believe he came on at nine o'clock. Yeah. And he was. I just love how music's all different. Maggie knew the. They loved the lineup. Like she, you sent Ashley videos, and Ashley was the whole time like. It was just, it was like a theatrical, amazing performance. Like it's it was, a scene. It's it was scene. awesome. Yeah. And you, you can't wait to go again. Yeah. Were there any jam sessions? Wait till you start like in fish <laughs> in college. We're really going to connect. I can't wait. No. 
<laughs> not having some watermelon it's, jam. It's gonna happen. I hate <laughs> no, to tell you. No, it's not. Find it. One, of you, one of you guys is gonna go to a not me. <laughs> Nori. I've got three will, other siblings. Nori. Nori and Fletch. Yeah. So. Yeah, and we have a big announcement. <laughs> I'm like, what show? <laughs> I I yeah, I wouldn't have a day. I wouldn't. You dare to say that? Hey, it's written in paper. November 29th is the season premiere of season seven for the show Main Cabin Masters. I'm just going record saying I don't believe it. <laughs> They're announcing next Friday, and this episode airs November 15th, so we're good. We're back in time. Yeah. So November 29th, so season everybody's seven. Everybody's about to know that I've been fibbing for a week because I'm See, still telling them. I about haven't that. been. I've been right on when I tell people end of November. I just say I know nothing. Minus that the food drive. <laughs> no, I've said, well, I gave one specific date. Isn't it funny, though? I, I, you don't think about how people perceive us, but I got a question there about commercials. Like, we don't know it. I, I guess people probably think you know, but you don't. We don't know anything. I mean, there's some weird coincidences with the commercials they air with what we're doing. Right, right, but we don't know what they're going to air. Like, we no, not at all, not that. at all. Like, but, like, when I first bought that, when I first bought Betsy, our sprinter van... Like, there happened to be Sprinter commercials in the middle of the episode. Interesting. Right? They, they, I mean, someone's listening to us. We know that. What about, like, the commercials with, like, the stair stringers and stuff? Because we get a lot of emails that are, like, Oh, guys. that's a bad one. Yeah. What do you mean the stair stringer? Is it, we Something have an app for that. Accurate. No, remember that one camp? I think it was a... Donovan camp. Yeah, where we did, a, like, a small, like, tip that they played. And they showed something where we said two by six stringers and we did them on edge and, like... Oh, I love those tips. They're so funny it to was watch. Like Dixie's, uh, um, oh, was that the saw horses? We that, did one that they remember screwed how up. remember how bad that got that. That yeah. was just one of those days we've been there for too long. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Too many, p- but of course they made that into a small. See, whatever. Not everything you see on TV is real. There you go. <laughs> you heard it here first. Yes. I like that succulent garden they make on a pallet that goes on the wall. That one's really interesting. Seen that, seen that one probably eight times. <laughs> it works pretty well. <laughs> Anyways, so yeah, we got a lot going on today. Yeah, and we've got uh, a great guest with us. Fred. I wonder what an Afghan dog looks like. I don't know. But we have a new, uh, speaking of Fred the Afghan dog, we have a new stray cat living with us now. Gonzo. Barn cat? I thought Gonzo already lived with you. No. He lives outside. He's inside now? Yep. It went to the vet, got fully checked out, and it moved right into Eva's room. That's two years quicker than Fletcher got one in the house. <laughs> <laughs> well, hey, guys, um, check out this great video by our friends at Hero Media Network. And after that, we'll be back with Craig and Fred. There's this theory that beer was really the reason why society started to build and create and that's why we called our brewery foundation brewing company that communal aspect was just a huge part of what we love to that's really what we love about the industry this was never going to be more than a hobby first time i ever made beer i was a student at university of michigan um so my degrees in chemistry and biochemistry and my entire goal at that point was to get into medical school get forward you know get my md and then uh, go practice which you know we did full-time for uh, 11 years. We were just kind of looking around and talking and decided at that point that it was time to make a shift. We opened in 2014. I did management consulting uh, for almost 20 years, so I had a lot of background in what a performance for a business look like. You're not going to start it in your own business without being a risk taker. But it never felt like a risk to us, I think. Like, I felt like we could do it because we were like together in it and we were doing it together. I, I trust John so much in his ideas and what he can accomplish and his understanding of what, what we can do that it's never felt as risky as it really is. I, I think breweries have really kind of become big part of that third space you know you have your workspace you have your home space and then you have the other the third space you meet friends you socialize you to share ideas and I think that's a big aspect of what we see ourselves as at the end of the day the importance of hospitality and sharing is like as old as human civilization and and this is just sort of the modern 
interpretation to that. So I think that that's a huge part of, of what we try to do. All right, and we are back with Craig and Fred. Yeah, what's up? Thanks for joining us. Oh, man. Fred's down here. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Fred's, uh, Fred's making himself at home, which is, doesn't take him very long, typically. <laughs> I bet we can get Fred around to the front with a good old dog treat, right? Yeah, oh, yeah. Come here, Freddy. Fred, Come go here, see buddy. Dad. Come here, sir. Hey, over here. I got him. Come here, Fred. You want a treat? Come here. He knows where they came from. Come here, buddy. Right here. <laughs> Come here, sir. Come on. There. You got to figure it out. There you go. Come on. Well, it's the first here. time we've had a dog be the, one of the Over guests. Here. I mean, our dogs come in, but they're not really the guests at all. It's true. It's true. Well, and he's and he's short too, so he's hard to hard to capture. <laughs> <laughs> he's down there and he's yeah, beautiful yeah. and he's happy and he's yeah. having fun. Can you sit? Good man. Yeah. And right. he's getting some of our dog treats we sell in the store. These yeah. are lobster treats for salty dogs. He's loving them. <laughs> yeah. He's loving those. How are they? I'll try one. <laughs> yeah. So I first heard about you from Maggie at Hatch Hill. Right. Can you ask him that question? Because I need to wash this down with something. <laughs> um, would you like a water, coffee, or oh. beer? Oh, right. I'll do. I'm. I'm all about the dash. Dash yes. seltzer. Fantastic. Oh. That's that's my go-to. Nice. Whew. Those those aren't actually bad. That's edible. <laughs> Is it? Yeah. The lobster. <laughs> I gotta try one too. Yes. And then today we have wonderful dash seltzer by our own Erica. Dash yeah. cranberry. Cranberry. Seltzer. So good. We were here for the for their launch. That was really fun. Chase, nice. sir. Oh, that was fun. You. Were, that was the first time we met you. Right. Right. Thank you. That smells good. It doesn't smell like lobster. I don't know if I can... I can taste the lobster. Fred, that's pretty good, bud. <laughs> it is pretty good. <laughs> yeah. If I accidentally ate that, I'd be like, oh, it's kind of like a bland... Yeah, it felt like I went to... I got to went, went to the health food store and I brought the he, wrong thing. He would think... You'd think this was like... <laughs> steak the way he's looking at it he is not by. impressed you guys are eating oh, cran no. <laughs> cranberry and lobster what a good co main combo yeah right <laughs> we're on to something here there you go we're starting out strong today <laughs> so yes start from the beginning yeah I mean, for everybody listening uh as a you know it's a story that i never ever get tired of of telling um uh i found fred in in afghanistan back in 2010 and um we were going i was uh my, my job in the Marines was intelligence. I was a human intelligence collector, which is such a weird thing to try to describe, but basically... It's kind of what I do now. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it is. It, it, was, <laughs> it was a fun kind of field to get into because I, I transferred into it after my first four years um, in the Marines. I, I was a, a military police. I worked in corrections, and I didn't, wasn't really excited about that. I loved being a Marine, didn't really like that field. Found the intel, the intel world and, and human intelligence specifically, and it really combined... Um, kind of who I am naturally, like I've always, you know, been able to connect with people and make friends and stuff like that. And, uh, I've always been very social and, and, um, uh, this field is basically it does, it teaches you how to kind of, I hate to say weaponize, but that's basically what it is kind of weaponized communication and, and like, and, and kind of overcome, uh, barriers, you know, like whether they're social or religious or cultural or just language barriers and just kind of connect with people and, and all in the name of gathering, information that ultimately could become intelligence that helps kind of keep keep marines and keep people safe on the battlefield so um i was attached to recon which are, recon marines are kind of like the the special forces or the seals of the marine corps they're our high, most highly trained guys um they don't go anywhere fun they don't go anywhere <laughs> nice they only send right. send them to the hot spots and um and in october actually early uh, late, late september early october of 2010 we started getting briefed on where we were going. We were going to go into this area called Sangin. And uh, it was the first time I saw any of those guys nervous. These guys had been oh, seeing wow. stuff all over the world, um, multiple combat deployments, and we're looking around and they're shifting in their seats as the, intel as the analysts are briefing us on Sangin and we're seeing stats from other units that have been in Sangin. The British Marines had been in there for years and they, the British public actually like demanded them leave because wow. they were losing so many Marines. Yikes. Um, it was just it, Taliban kind of, you know, owned the place basically. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, getting ready to go in there, we're expecting the absolute worst. And in many ways, that's exactly what we found. The first seven days, seven to 10 days was just sun up to sundown, constantly being bombarded with really accurate fire, mortars, uh, RPGs, big caliber machine guns, just like just coming at us, constantly trying to run us off this little hill because there was no base for us to go to. We inserted out of helicopters and kind of commandeered an abandoned house and made it, fortified it as best we could with sandbags. And it was, you know, just the best we could get security-wise. And they knew that we would be, we were relatively exposed. You're probably the most popular guys in town. Yeah, exactly. Um, and in between, 
just, you know, kind of daily engagements, we would look around and we'd see this little dog. We'd see this dog like trotting around the battlefield, you know, and, like, and it was like a like he was like a cartoon character, you know, in this like really dark place. It was so funny. And all of us would just would just look at him and like poke each other and be like, look at this guy. Does he know where he is? You know, it was just so funny. And because like, you see a lot of dogs over there. And, and unfortunately, a lot of them aren't doing very well. They're rough. They're 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 mean. They roam around in packs. You know, it's what you would expect mm-hmm. a dog to become yeah. if it doesn't have a, a positive kind of you know somebody taking care of it. And, and he was he was old enough to kind of have become one of those. He wasn't like a baby puppy, you know. And, and so we were all just instantly kind of intrigued. And after the, that first you know seven to ten days, I can't remember exactly how long it was. The the Taliban kind of got the message. They left us alone, and started at least just started to back off a little bit. And we had some time to breathe, and, and uh, I pulled up my computer and started typing away, trying to get reports back to the rear as fast as I could, just just trying to get to shape the area. And and I see I see him again. I see this like tail, like periscope across the top of my computer screen, and I'm like, God, man, there he is. Like I gotta check him out. And so I grabbed a piece of jerky, and started walking over to him. And I probably got like 10, 12 feet from him, and I almost turned around right on the spot because I was like, this dog is a mess. He, he's got bugs all over him oh. his fur is matted his i could see his ribs and and i and when we get briefed when we get to afghanistan you get briefed on a lot of, all the stuff you can't do and all the you know all this stuff and i hear i heard the person the 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 vet you know kind of in my head like you don't don't approach stray dogs and i and i almost was like yeah leave him alone he, he's not interested and um i got a little closer and he started wagging his tail and i was like oh he's wagging his tail like that's it like that's all i need to see and <laughs> and it was the last thing i thought he would do he had nothing to wag his tail about um, and he followed me around after that and, um, all the guys, we all fell in love with him. And, and from there, the, it was the beginning and, and, uh, of like, of his journey. And, and, uh, and I, but I go back, you know, of all the things we've done since then and, and how challenging it was to get him the rest of the way home. I go back to those, to those first moments all the time because he wagged his tail when he had no reason to, and it's made a huge difference in his life and, and, and mine too, you know? Yeah. Well, if it makes you feel any better, I brief Ashley every time we go to another country not to talk, to touch the dogs and talk to them, pet them, and mm-hmm. doesn't do any good either. Yeah, I know. <laughs> She's got a pack of dogs right. following her. I was like, right. oh, God. Yeah. yeah, especially in Puerto Rico, they have those, those beautiful was, dogs. And now there's, you can get one. Like you, there's a uh, Sado, I think, is the, yeah. the rescue. They'll bring them. But what yeah. a comforting sight, though, when you're going through that, and it just probably, for a minute, you felt human again, I bet. Mm-hmm. That's exactly right. I mean, it was, it, it was just just that first moment with him giving him a, that jerky and kind of giving him a pet it, it the battlefield and the stress of, of that environment really melted away you know and, and I wasn't a marine thousands of miles from home I was just a just a guy with a dog you know and we all felt that way over the course of, of that that first mission you know we just Fred did that for us you know it was pretty pretty amazing yeah now did Fred did he come to you the like did you get him have that bond? Yeah, yeah, he, he he definitely bonded with me the most. I also gave him the most jerky, <laughs> um, but it was like, but it was me. And I think the reason that it really fell on my shoulders too to to really to take it on was because um, I had a reputation as the as the the intel guy of like just getting stuff done, not necessarily asking, you know, for forgiveness rather than permission kind of approach to a lot yep. of stuff. And that's that's the that's what. Um, het uh, we're that's i was a het guy human exploitation team and that's that's what we're known for so you know he he picked the right marine i guess is what i'm trying to say that i, I wasn't i was going to be uh i was going to utilize a lot of uh, a lot of assets to to get him the rest of the way back yeah <laughs> yeah um and it, and he and i mean getting him from the battlefield back to our base was the first part it was the first big challenge because and you guys had a big moment you i remember you telling me this story along this yeah. summer you had a big moment so yeah. tell us about that moment yeah yeah it was it was it because it was risky it, under the best of circumstances it was risky <laughs> and i was like look if we're gonna do this i really need to know that it's what he wants and i don't want to be dragging him to the helicopter you know what i mean like i, I don't want to feel like i was taking him um and so i left it up to him and we He's, he proved it to me twice because what we ended up doing was breaking down. It was we had they had our location dialed in like they we weren't going to have a helicopter come and pick us up there because the Taliban would have gotten it right away. So we had to break everything down kind of covertly and move through the night into the desert, uh, the opposite direction of, of where all where all the Taliban was, and get as much standoff as we could so we could safely extract. 
and it ended up being like a six mile ruck out into the desert that all night. Wow. And until we found a suitable place we could hold up and he didn't follow us. I was like, well, that's it. You know, he stuck around like that's where he knows. Like, I was like, all right. And the next morning, somebody calls out. They're like looking through the through our bind. I was just watching the perimeter, and they see this little ball of dust, like <laughs> rumbling. It was like homeward bound, you know. Like he's just like trotting through the desert, and they're like, "It's Fred! It's Fred!" And he comes running through. And he's like, "Hey, what's going on?" And everybody's laughing, and I'm like, "All right, like that's it. Here he is, you know." But I still wanted one more thing. I, I wanted him to follow me to the helicopter, and and if he did that, I would know for sure, you know. And so I had a duffel bag in my pocket. And I was like, all right, man, if, if, the, if you're not scared off by the rotors and the wind and the dust and the chaos of like a, a huge helicopter coming down, you know, and you come with me, then I'll know for sure. And, and uh, sure enough, he was right on my heel, you know, and, and uh, my, my buddy, Mark, uh, who's our master sergeant, um, grabbed, him, grabbed Fred by the scruff, lifted him like a jug of milk, you know, and was yeah. like, we're doing this. And I was like, yeah, okay. And like, we stuffed him in this duffel bag and zipped it closed. <laughs> <laughs> and t- and t- Mark held one side of the duffel, and I held the other. We tried to make it look heavy because right away we were anyone on that helicopter, any of the landing crew, because there's a little security team that comes to watch our backs while we're running on. Yeah. And, and, and not to say that all Marines aren't trustworthy, but like the, if they had seen it, seen us with Fred, that could have started the rumor mill. That could have started you know the word getting out. And so it, it right away we had to hide him from anyone that outside of our unit. And so we stuffed him in this duffel bag and go running up the back of the helicopter. And I'll never forget sitting on the floor of the helicopter. Um, and we all are just filthy, like just covered in dirt and grime and beards and like all these tough Marines with all of our gear and guns and stuff. And I look around the helicopter and all I see is teeth because everyone's smiling so big. Oh, that's awesome. Because they know we got him. You know, yep. Fred's yep. with us. And uh, yeah, that was that was a, another moment that I think about a lot. I go back to all the time. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> and now you are both authors. Yeah, right? Yeah. <laughs> and seriously, it, it's it, as exciting as those first moments were in the helicopter ride and, you know, and all that stuff was, it, it's, it, it, the journey has continued in so many ways, you know, with the, um, but it took me a while. It took, um, you know, I came home and I tried to just keep moving. You know, I thought I, I got a I got a job working for the Defense Intelligence Agency in, in D.C. I grew up down there, so all my friends were around me. I had a a new truck, uh, you know, an apartment in a cool part of town, and like I, it felt like within a year I had moved on, but uh, I hadn't. You know, I hadn't really dealt with a lot of the loss and a lot of the stuff that um, I'd experienced over there, and and. It took Fred just the way he is, just how he trots. Still that battlefield trot. He was doing that around <laughs> D.C. And I would take him on runs and take him on walks around our neighborhood. And everywhere we go, people would stop me and be like, what kind of dog is that? What kind of dog is that? They, they had to know. And for a long time, I would I would just say, yeah, he's a pocket wolf. You know, I would just make up a breed. Right, right, right. And people would always be like, yeah, I've heard of those. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm like, okay. You know, and, and I didn't want to talk about it. I didn't want to go there because I, I, took, I took a page out of – what I had received from previous generations of veterans and like I had an uncle that was in World War II and I'd, I'd known a lot of Vietnam veterans and like they just came home and they didn't talk about it, right? Mm-hmm. I was like, that's what I'm supposed to do. And, and eventually it'll just fade away. And and so I, I tried to kind of distance myself from even from Fred's story. And little by little, I started to tell it. People, I started to be like, you know what? He's from Afghanistan and like this is where I found him and this is how I got him home. And it's it's a great story. And the more I told it, the more I remembered, the more I remembered, the more I, I appreciated it, and the more I saw, you know, just purpose in, in the whole thing. Um, and so it was like, you know, almost three years after coming home that I realized I really needed to do something with this story. And um, and it was a couple more years until I, I became a published author, but we never looked back, yeah. Nice. Yeah. Now, did you get reprimanded any for Guy, this? Yeah, no, no. Uh, I, I maybe would have. If yeah. I, if, uh, if, I had stayed in, and and I think that was another initial reason that I didn't tell the story all the time yeah. because I was living in D.C. and you never know who you're talking to at the dog park. It could you know it could be a, <laughs> could right. be a colonel, you know, it could be some and be like, really, what, who, what you know, were you with? Who was this? You know, where was this? I'm He's like, over oh, writing down yeah, stuff on the side. Yeah, yeah. Um, Can you repeat your name, please? Yeah, right, right. <laughs> so uh, that was kind of my initial reason for not really sharing it, and 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 I think I I, I that was a just a justification for ultimately not you know digging deep in, within myself and. Um, but no, I mean, it, it, to when you write a book, and this has been my, my experience, when, you, when you're a veteran, 
uh, I think anybody from the like, with government kind of experience, and you write a book, you you have two choices. You can either uh, submit it to the Pentagon and before it's published, the final kind of manuscript before it's published, and they clear it um, of any uh, sensitive stuff, or you can just sign a thing that says there's nothing sensitive in this and hope that you're right. And what you're risking is your book getting yanked off the shelves and like yep. you're never going to get published again and all that stuff. So, uh, you know, I, I submitted the final manuscript to the Pentagon and that was their chance to be like, wait, you did what? <laughs> you know? <laughs> um, and what was great was uh, it's, a you know, obviously a very busy office. You know, they have a lot of speeches to read and like books to clear and all that stuff. And I was expecting it to take like a year, maybe like six six months to a year, and we got it back in like three and a half months, and like and it had bells on it. They were like, you know, people were upset that they didn't get to read it when it was in the office. They were like, "This is the best thing we've read. We read <laughs> oh, so much awesome. boring stuff." Nice. You know? Yeah. And and we did a book signing in the Pentagon uh, uh, that when the book came out, which I thought maybe was a trap, but it, <laughs> ah, <laughs> right, we, right. it worked out. Yeah. No. Bail me out, Fred. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so you know, we I, I think um, you know just. Uh, from a from a PR standpoint, it would have looked really bad if they'd come after me, you know, <laughs> after you know after the fact. But um, if I had gotten caught with him in Afghanistan, um, he would have been put down, and I would have gotten I definitely would have gotten in trouble for sure. Um, you know, sneaking him onto a helicopter during an extract in a really <laughs> hostile area, um, they could have really you know made an example out of me for sure. Uh, and more more importantly, you know, would have cost him his cost him his life. So you got him out of the hot zone mm -hmm. to your base. Right. And then you could pull some springs with people with buddies and everyone's kind of in on it. Yeah. And then... Yeah. It was, it, uh, you know, it was, it, and that was something I didn't really appreciate until I sat down to, to, to write the story and to tell the story was just how incredibly like incredible the timing was because when we went out on that mission, uh, we were, we were leaving from camp Leatherneck, which was like, I, I always just say like, it, it was with comparison to where we were going, it was like the Mall of America. It was like air conditioning, Wi-Fi, a Pizza Hut, like Con Xbox, like, you know, dropped Pizza Hut, um, you know, like just all the trappings of, you know, of comfort. Um, and so, you know, bringing him from from the field back to that place was, was really risky. Um, and, but when we left, their DHL, the ship, the international mm -hmm. shipping company, they weren't even there. And, when we come back on the helicopter, I have Fred in the duffel bag. I have two buddies show up with a with a pickup, a little Toyota pickup, and I like roll in the back of it, and I'm like, "Go, you know, get me out of here!" <laughs> and they like, drive tearing through the the, it was the the Camp Ashton where the British where the where the the airstrip was, and I look over the side of the pickup truck and I see a little sign that says DHL, and I was like, "Those are that's it. Those, that's how I'm getting them out of here because I can't go through the post office. It's all controlled by." Right, the military right. and the yeah, government, yeah, yeah. you know, and, and so I stuck Fred. In, I had a little room where I, like a couple guys, you know, we shared a space. I left him there, and I went walking down to to the DHL compound, and they're literally like plugging in their computers and like setting up shop. You know, it was meant to like be. taking cellophane off of stuff, and and, <laughs> and I'm like, hey, you know, I'm trying to be cool about it. You know, like, hey, hypothetically, <laughs> you know, if I had a dog and the guy saw right through me instantly, like, you know, all this talk about me being a, an intelligence, you know, spooky guy. This guy right. from Uganda, I think he was from Uganda, you know, just looked right through me. and was like, bring me the dog. I want to see this dog. I'm like, oh, all right. You know, and, and he's the sweetest guy. Um, That's awesome. And, and like they all, the whole DHL team just fell in love with Fred. And they ended up watching him because we only had a two week break. We were going right back to Sangin. And so my first thing was how, I couldn't even really worry about getting him out. I had to figure out where I was going to leave him when I went back to the field. And they stepped up when they were like, "Yeah, we'll you know we'll make him our pet." Well, and and he and Fred actually ended up masquerading as like a as like a contraband sniffing dog <laughs> because anytime anytime uh, you know U.S. like a like a general or like a convoy would come by DHL to like inspect stuff or whatever, they would put a little like leash around his neck and like walk him by pallets of stuff and he would just naturally like sniff the boxes you know and people would be like oh it's just like the DHL working dog <laughs> not knowing that he was plucked from the, like the battlefield you know uh, yeah. that's so, awesome yeah it's really funny yeah and then it was it was just there's a thing in the Marine Corps uh, we call the the at least when I was in it was called the Lance Corporal Underground and it's the the lower three enlisted ranks are if you need something done you, you go to them 
right? And because and, they're the majority of the Marine Corps, the bottom three ranks. And uh, and uh, that's where I went to get a lot of the stuff to get like the kennel. He flew home in a, uh, you don't say stolen, you say tactically acquired. Uh, <laughs> he flew home in a tactically acquired military police dog kennel. So it's this huge kennel for like a Malinois, you know, or like a German shepherd. Yeah. And it's this little stray dog sitting in it, you know. And, um, so yeah, it was just a, 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 a crazy journey that I, I continue to kind of just appreciate the more I share it and the more I hear from people who have, have read our book and, and stuff like that. Yeah. yeah. What is the name of the book? Hmm. Sorry. I, just, I love this. No. this stuff. It's so good. <laughs> um, it's called, my first book is called Craig and Fred. Craig and a Fred. Marine, a stray dog and how they rescued each other. And what's really cool is there's two versions. There's a, a regular adult version. Um, that's, you know, just it's a regular book, and, and the and then there's a young reader, a young reader yeah. adaption uh, adaptation. So it's uh, for ages eight, eight and up. And the only big difference between the two is that some of the adult adult you know marine talk is taken out of it, and and the chapters read kind of differently. And in, in, in the regular version, uh, one chapter takes place in Afghanistan, the next one takes place on a road trip I went on with Fred and a buddy uh, Josh, who's an Army veteran, and. Uh, just an incredible guy and we did a, a big road trip one summer just to figure out you know what we we're going to do after the military and um and so the chapters kind of weave back and forth like that which makes it kind of an interesting read um and we have a new book that came out in april um about about maine a lot of it really? about maine and how we nice. ended up here it's called second chances um and uh because yeah I grew, like i said i grew up down in virginia you know and my first time in maine was uh on the way to afghanistan actually Stop in Bangor? Yep, yep. And I never forgot it. I never forgot those troop greeters that came right. to just spend time with us. You know, I had my first, like, real lobster roll in the Bangor airport, you know, and, and it was just the coolest thing. And they're the first ones you see when you come home. And it stuck with me. And when I got my book deal, we were living in D.C. still. And my wife now, she was my girlfriend at the time, my wife was like, you know, wherever you want to go to finish this, because the publisher only gave me three months to finish the book. I had written most of it, but it was still kind of daunting. And I started looking, you know, in the mountains of Virginia, the mountains of West Virginia, kind of areas that I was familiar with, and my search just kind of kept leading me north. And then I found this little cottage right on the water uh, up in Sullivan. Oh, yeah. And I was on Airbnb, and I was I contacted the owner, and they were like, yeah, we're all boarded up for the winter. You know, like, this is kind of a <laughs> summer thing. But, you know, like, we'll open it up for you. And so they opened it up, and, and I spent three months in Sullivan just cranking um, cranking out the book. And, and I was originally that was the plan was just to go up there to finish the book, and but we never left Maine. We just fell in love That's with awesome. it. That's awesome. Nice. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, yeah, it's – it's uh, and that that's kind of where I was excited to write about with Second Chances. My, my new book was how we ended up here, why we stayed. And specifically, it's about uh, Fred and I volunteer at the at the prison at, over in Warren at the Maine mm -hmm. State Prison with um, a lot of them are veterans who are incarcerated. All of them are working with dogs um, to train them as, as service dogs. And it's kind of some of their stories and some of the dog stories and uh, some of the staff up there that are just incredible. They're, they're in the book, too. It was fun to write about. It was fun to write about other people. Uh, that was the hardest part with my first book was so much of it was about me. And that's always hard to to, to focus on. So it was good to to kind of share other people's experiences and stories. How was the writing experience? You know, that's not your background. Right. I it just think, came natural. Yeah, you know, I think I was not a good student, uh, <laughs> which is not a surprise to anybody that's, that really knows me. Uh, but I, I, I struggled in school, C's and D's, you know, barely, you know, and it was tough growing up in Virginia, in Northern Virginia, because all, all my friends were really smart. Seemed like they had their lives figured out by junior year, you know, what college, at least what college they were going to go to. And I was not, I was barely going to graduate. Um, and so, you know, I was just, it was interesting that, you know, when I started to write, I did, I instantly kind of felt comfortable doing that. And I started to, I thought about it, you know, later on, I was like, I think the first thing and the only thing I ever felt really comfortable doing in school was writing. Um, you know, I, I always felt like I could express myself really articulately on, on paper. And I always enjoyed it. Um, it, it took me a while to kind of, uh, it took me going back to school actually, which I thought I would never do. Um, I left the government after two years and uh, and and uh, got snuck into Georgetown. I don't know how I got into Georgetown down in D.C. But they, somebody was feeling generous and <laughs> and uh, and it was it was it was writing for school again, writing papers and stuff every week. That I was like, I, everybody's complaining about this, but I kind of like the writing process. I like having an idea, having an argument, and having to defend it. You know, and and, and so I thought, all right, I can I can write a book. I love this story. You know, and, and uh, let's let's do it. And so. Yeah, it was kind of a 
almost a kind of a, like a rediscovery of myself. And I, I do, I owe that to Fred and my wife too. I mean, she was the one that I would have talked myself out of it so many times. Um, if it wasn't for her and if it wasn't for Fred, you know, that's all. And now you're in Maine. Yeah. And you love it. Love it. Dude, I, I feel like I, I love, I love where I'm from. I'm very grateful for having grown yeah. up down there. Um, and, and, and nothing against, you know, Virginia and, and that area. Um, but I, I, I very early felt like I was misplaced because I'm a hockey player. I've been a hockey player since elementary school, <laughs> you know, I've, and I love winter. I love, you know, I love being outdoors and, and I love just like, I love so much about the culture of Maine. And it was, it was, it's the first time I've really felt home, especially since after getting out of the Marines, like just the sense of community up here and how everybody, you know, looks out for each other, but also gives each other space, you know, like it's just a really special special part of the country. I'm, I'm really glad that, that uh, Fred really kind of just led me up here. How did Fred do with the Maine winters? He loves it. <laughs> he loves winter. It's funny. You know, he's a desert boy. Right, he, right. He does. He loves the snow. He, lo- he gets a whole, um, he hasn't gotten it yet because uh, we were spent a whole, the whole month of October um, in the South on speaking events, but um, he gets a whole top coat of like darker fur and he gets these little like polka dots all over him that are like super orange. Yeah. And it's like this whole other, like we call it winter Fred, you know, and you can tell winter's winter coming when, when he starts to, when you start to see these spots on him <laughs> and, he gets, and he just gets extra majestic and like he loves like trying to catch mice under the snow and stuff like that. So yeah, he's, he's into it. And I think just even in the summer, it's not super hot. So we, we can do a long hike and it doesn't wipe him out like yeah. it does down south where it's so hot. You can, you can barely move, you know, like he loves, we've done a lot of the 4,000 footers and stuff. He loves it. Yeah. Nice. So you're traveling around the country. Yep, we're starting to. I mean, before before uh, you know everything with COVID, we were yeah. we were constantly on the road for months at a time, speaking events, yeah. um, which is so much fun. You know, it's everything from you know a, a whole town in Wisconsin, um, this incredible little dairy town uh, in Wisconsin that brought the book in as their ta- their town read. Oh wow! So like both of their high schools and their elementary school and everyone in the town read Craig and Fred. It was awesome. That's got to be it's pretty. Called, it's this really cool town. If you ever, if you get ever, a key to the city. I mean, it felt like because it. we show, it's, it's called, you got the book to the city. You we're don't driving. Hear we're driving there, and it's like, and it's it's called Hillsboro, and it's just cornfield, 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 cornfield. You know, dairy cows and everything, and 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 we show up in this little town, and we see like our posters on the on the like light posts, <laughs> and everybody instantly knows who Fred is, and they're like waving <laughs> at him. And, yeah, they knew, but hey, Fred, yeah. Fred, say hi to Maggie. <laughs> And so it's everything from, from that, you know, and that was an incredible thing because they ended up, um, they brought in veterans from around their community in the week leading up to our visit. So it was, you know, veterans from all these different generations going into their schools and like in in small groups, talking to kids in their classrooms about what it was like for them to serve. And the woman who, Jackie, who organized the event said like, I, there was my, our guy down the road, our neighbor down the road. I had no idea he was in Vietnam. He never talked about it. Yeah. But he showed up at the elementary school and was like talking to kids about his time in Vietnam, you know, and it was just incredible. So it was just, it meant so, it means so much to me to see our story doing that, you know, our story bringing people together, our story inspiring people to share a little bit more about themselves. And so it's stuff like that to colleges who, you know, we will speak to the whole college to like, you know, corporate, corporate events. We've done stuff with MGM and um, different companies, progressive insurance and stuff like that all over the country. It's been really fun. Um, and now that things are, you know, we're, we're getting, getting around the, um, a lot of the challenges of the, of the pandemic, we're starting to see events, events pick back up, which is really great. Yeah. Fred loves to travel. He, he, know, he, and he knows a crowd. He knows when the crowd is like, when it's a bunch of kids, you know, we walk in an auditorium, like he, you can tell he knows everybody's there for him and it's pretty funny. <laughs> yeah. I, I love how like you just brought that story up that he's getting older veterans to talk because like what you said earlier, it seems like back in the day that. They didn't talk to it and people mm-hmm. didn't deal with stuff. Mm-hmm. And now it's like, it seems like you talk about stuff and you work through it. Yeah. And, yeah. And that's part of like your role, which is awesome. And, and even to touch people that have been putting stuff away for 30, 40 years, that's, that's amazing. Right. Yeah. It's, it's a, it's an unanticipated kind of, um, kind of happening from, from sharing, you know, and, and yeah, and it's something I'm really proud to have seen. Like a lot of my, my guys, my buddies that are still in are getting ready to retire. Some of them have, you know, more deployments than they do fingers, you know, like 10, 12, 11, 13, 14 deployments. And, and when I talk to them though, they, they don't really, they don't want to talk necessarily about 
all the things they've accomplished, all the things they've done. They want to talk about their trauma. They want to talk about how they're working through the loss of a, of a teammate or, you know, something that happened, you know, that was frustrating. Like they're, they're interested in working and leaning into those difficult topics, which makes me so proud, Mm -hmm. you know, um, that, that, that we, this generation of veterans are able to kind of learn, you know, not necessarily from mistakes. There's no wrong way to, to deal with that stuff, but, but to just kind of grow through and, and see that you do have to deal with it. Um, you know, and, and, uh, and it's, it's, you know, it's, it's a, a blessing that our story, if our story can, can inspire someone to, to do that, whether they're a veteran or not. I mean, that's, that's just huge. That's absolutely huge. Yeah. yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. Good boy, Fred. Yeah. So do we have a few um, fan questions for oh, you? Oh yeah. For you okay. and you'll have to answer on Fred's behalf. Yeah. 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 Of course. Right. right. <laughs> well, we kind of, we kind of already answered most of them. Somebody does want to know, Terry wants to know how many treats has Fred gotten oh, since geez. you've come stateside? Oh, okay. plenty. <laughs> plenty yeah he's he's funny though he's got a kind of a sweet tooth um i think like a lot of times people want to know what his favorite treats are and he, and he's, he, love, he loves a donut he loves a good like, <laughs> nothing wrong with yeah not he's not a donut all. guy i knew i, I liked him be, yeah it, he loves a good like it's like old-fashioned you know nothing on it or but 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 if it's like a like, yeah, a, like yeah. a sugar powdered sugar donut like you can't keep it away from him i have a couple yeah. day old ones in my truck yeah that would be perfect yeah. Nice. Fred. <laughs> yeah he loves a donut it's, pretty it's apple cider donut season right too. yep exactly yeah so yeah he's he's had He's had his share of uh, share of treats. That's why. That's one of the reasons we, we stay so active, so we can keep <laughs> keep those that treat weight off, right, buddy? Yeah. <laughs> nice. Yeah. And then, lastly, how do people buy your book and find out more information that yeah. kind of stuff? Yeah, that's. Uh, I always forget to mention that stuff, so that's great. Uh, Fred is uh, his Facebook is Fred the Afghan. His Instagram is Fred the Afghan. Uh, our website is FredTheAfghan.com. And you get our books wherever you get your books. You know, I always encourage people to, to, to go to their local bookstores. Um, but wherever wherever books are sold, you can find uh, find Craig and Fred and find Second Chances. And Shop. A, Kennebec, Cabin Company. Yeah, there's, we got copies <laughs> Perfect. here. Perfect. There's, a, there's an audio book, too, which is really fun. Fred was in the booth for the recording nice. of both audio books, which is really <laughs> funny. You hear him, like, shaking around every once in a while. Um, and, and your yeah. social media, because you do events. You've been with us before, and you come yeah. and hang out with us again. Yeah, yeah social media. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's Fred the Afghan and... And we're getting ready to do Fred Fred calendars. Fred, Fred's a nice. cal- Fred's a calendar model. Fred's so, yeah, a pinup. Yeah, those will be on their web on our website <laughs> soon. And we've got we've got hats and, and shirts and stuff too. And, and Fred's got his own. My wife designed uh, collars and leashes and stuff that kind of tell the story of Fred. Which oh, that's people, awesome. People love that. Very yeah. cool. Well, yeah, yeah. I'm gonna have a drink to Fred. Hey, cheers, yeah. cheers. Yeah, to you guys, to Fred. Yeah, yeah to for, Fred for everything yeah. you've done for us. Thank oh, you thank very you. much, yeah. bud. No, of course. Cheers. Yeah, thank you for joining us. Oh, thank you for having me. It's really really a privilege. I love. I love the power of dogs. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. exactly. Dogs and music, man. Like, yeah. It's just amazing what it they can do with us, life. Right? Yeah. yeah, exactly. It's a, that we need more reminders of of, uh, of the things that bring us together, you know, and dogs and music totally do yeah. that too. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah, guys. Well, this thank you very, thank much. You very much. much. Of course. Thank you. See you, Fred. <laughs> And we are back with Project Pointers. If you have a question for us about your camp that we can hopefully answer, submit a short video and your question to podcast at maincabmasters.com. If we select your answer, we will try and answer as best we can. Don't forget your name and where you're from in as much detail as possible. I mean, I'll start taking life advice questions, too, if they got if they need any advice. So, No? I All hope right. they don't. I mean, there <laughs> is not where you should go for that. All right. We're sticking to Project Pointers here. Okay. What are you, you ready? for us? This one is from Vincent Bernardo. I purchased a pine log home in North Stonington, Connecticut about four years ago. I had a contractor from Maine come down and sanded the house to the original wood with hand sanders and applied Q8 log oil. The house looked amazing. About 12 months in, I had started to get some mold on the house, and I've done a bunch of spot checks with multiple products to try and remove the mold. And they all either remove some of the stain or cause streaking. I've debated using weather seal stain that has a sealant in it so it would be easier to wash the mold off in between applications, but not sure if that would adhere properly since Q8 was already applied about two and a half years ago. I have also heard that oil-based stains with sealant have their own issues years down the line. 
I've also been advised never to use a top coat over the stain as when that breaks down, moisture and mold could start growing underneath and then That's the house true. would need to be sanded slash media blasted again and I don't want to do that again. Got all that? Yep. Yes. Well, it sounds like he did the right thing and had it media blast the first time. Correct. But this, it's permeable. Yep. I mean, I would go with a Benjamin Moore product. Yep. <laughs> right? Um, I think it all depends on what the original product on there is. Because a lot of those have, like, waxes and oils. So you, what I would say is don't, you don't have to take it down, but a good power wash and use the same product unless you're going to take it down to bare wood again. And then I would use something like a good Benjamin Moore product, something like that. With a you little... almost want to put a barrier over the whole thing if you're going to redo it. Yeah. Something with some mildew resistance because pine logs are tough on the exterior. If you use, if you want to keep that, if you want to, everybody wants to keep that nice, fresh, new look, but it's really tough. To I'm still picturing the guy hand sanding that poor thing. Oh, yeah. I mean, if but if you want ease, like I would, like back in the day, all the old like the fences, Huck Finn, you just put layer and layer of paint on. You know, then you wipe off and everything. But like you said earlier, like you can trap stuff in too. Right, right, right. So I think, you know, you could do a power washing with a vinegar mixture because vinegar is going to kill any mold or mildew or a, so a TSB cleaner. What's TSB stand for? Totium, sodium STP. So glad your dad's a paint and stain expert, not me. Totium. Sodium triphosphate, STP. Oh, I actually or am Stone learning Temple about Pilots. triphosphates in go, bio. There you go. But, you know, some sort of cleaner, some some sort of detergent that's not very, you know, good harsh. for the environment, something that's not harsh. Depends on how much you take off of the original coating. If you don't take that much, put back on the same coating. But if you take it all, you know, if you're fairly confident that you've taken it all off, then go with some sort of, I would go with a darker oil-based transparent or semi-transparent stain that's going to have some pigment and hold color and re repel mildew i'd also have to bet that where he's getting molds on the north side of the house you know the northeastern side of the house you know it's not getting all the sun so you what you just want to power wash those yeah every, you know every couple months it'll help you out just just a light power wash to get that off there i just actually at my new house um i just you know some algae was starting over the years because the north side and i just washed it this year and i probably should have done it a little bit quicker yeah but anyone that doesn't get direct sun the north side of your house is gonna that's gonna happen regardless and same thing, yeah. Sunlight, air movement is going to help fight that. And same thing, directing the water away, um, putting drip edge around for splashback. Mm -hmm. You know, we'll do a camp in first rainstorm before we Francis comes in, does his drip edge. There's always mud. Oh, I hate that. It's like getting <laughs> sand on your feet at the beach. It's one of my biggest pet peeves. Yeah. Yeah. So. I think that's keep doing what you're doing, but I would I would have more maintenance on like just a good old water power wash to keep the mildew off. Yeah, good luck. Yeah, thank you, Vince. That's a good question. Very detailed, and we kind of sound like we knew what we're talking which about. Which we appreciate. Give us another one. We're on fire. Okay. <laughs> um, pick a number one through four. Three. Okay. Uh, we have a camp on MDI on a lake with lake drawn water. Mount Desert Island. Lucky folks. Yes. What are the pros and cons of leaving water hose in lake all winter? Our family has done that for years, but now as new owners, we are not sure what is best. I say if she doesn't freeze. Even if she does freeze. Leave her. Yeah. You most oh. likely have a foot valve on the end of it, and as long as the foot valve is down, you know. It won't crack your pipes or it comes up and the, and the ice expands. As long as there are no bends or elbows or anything like that, the ice will, you know, go slide up and down. Slide up and down, oh, yeah. and you should be fine. Um, you, you see those people that were forward thinking that, like when the, when the time was right, they put that line underneath. That's yeah, that's what we have up to Clearwater. But yeah, I think you know, periodic maintenance on the foot valve. You know, you might get some algae growing or something, but that's going to happen regardless. I was just pitching Dixie switching your mom's foot valve. <laughs> <laughs> you 
in that stream. I was like a tiny oh. bit of water. Yeah, that... and I just and I just had a bunch of foot valve stories like coming. Well, no, in. but that's a perfect example. Yeah. I mean, my parents, Margie's foot valve on cause <laughs> for the longest time were drawing water right out of the stream, and it was in that stream year round. You know, it sucks in the middle of the winter when it moves, or you got to reset it, or in the summertime when it gets low and just gets a little stagnant. But, but it's it's doable. I'm amazed at how good the quality water quality you can get if you use filters like. You know, you got to change them a lot, but they and they we've used a couple high end filters like to, we could drink it. Yeah, but it's all about maintenance and keeping on top of that. Yeah, but yes, as long as you have a, a straight shot with that black plastic, you should have no issue with it. You know, it can expand because with the mm-hmm. ice, it will expand a little bit, but it's going to typically expand along with the pipe. If she's not broke, yep. don't fix it. But don't change it. One one good point to mention is with your pump. Make sure you bring your pump. You know, a lot of people will just disconnect their pump, bring it into the camp. You run the risk of any water in the impeller cracking that, and then that's going to ruin your pump. Where you want to make sure you either run antifreeze through it or take it and bring it some home somewhere where it's going to stay above freezing. Quick side note: One time I thought my pump was done, so I did some YouTubing, and I had to take the pump away, and I had to vegetable oil the seals. Sometimes they just get stuck, so never give up on your pump. (laughs) Okay. Do you want to do one more or do you want to not do one more? Let's do one more. Kind of had to the way way you led us into that. Yeah. What number are you going for, Chase? One, two, or four left on the table. I'm going to go two. All right. We don't want the first. We don't want the last. This one is from Pam Rogers. My question is, what is the best way to go about making sure you are getting a handyman slash carpenter slash contractor who actually has the skills you need? (laughs) I've been burned a couple times and I'm leery of going ahead on a couple of more projects that need to be done. Well, I used to, before I hooked up with my beautiful (laughs) wife and my moral family, I was on this app called Service Magic where I own a fence company. I would buy leads so they would qualify me. And I would pay for leads. Really? Yeah, but they, you know, they did all their research on me. It was awesome. I loved it. Like they had to qualify you. Yeah, but I, you know, I'd sp- I had so much money I'd spend per month, and I knew I'd probably sell, you know, four out of ten of them I'd get. Yep. But there's a lot of lead based places out there now. I don't even think the homeowner doesn't have to pay for them. Right. 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 You right, know, right. but there's Angie's List. Yeah. And there's some other stuff. And the number one rule I tell people is, right now, this time time of year, this. Good luck. Yeah, and if you find somebody who's readily available, it's probably a reason. Question it. I mean that that is the advice we give. Sorry for all you young kids just got out of trade school, but that's the way it is. <laughs> <laughs> Come work for us and we'll keep you busy. <laughs> um, yeah, I think meet with the people. It's it, isn't it crazy how much has changed? I remember like in, growing up, eighties and nineties, carpenters like tradespeople got bad raps. There yeah. was not a lot of quality people. Out. Now the tides have changed. Yeah. Where did they say they were from? Or did they not? They did not. Yeah. You, I, you can't, there are lead sourced areas out there. Apps like Angie's List, other places. Yeah. Don't judge a person by their vehicle. Or what they look like. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. You know, if worse comes worse, ask for references. You know, find people. Go, find some, Go to your local Columbia. Yeah, that's the biggest thing. Like, go to, yes. you know, we go to Hammond. Lumber. People call us and ask us for help, and we just are so busy. So we like call, you know, call Hammond Lumber. Go call Dennis. Go, you know. Yep, that's a very good advice. Yeah. Go to local you know, lumberyard. Local lumberyard. Local lumberyard. Because I I learned I don't I don't really give out names. I don't. Right. You know, you want me want to trust people. So. Yep. Call Columbia. Okay. Well, that, that was a good. I think we nailed Project Pointers this week. <laughs> Sweet. Well, then let's move on to regular questions. But thank you for the questions. Keep them coming in, and podcast at Main Cab Masters to submit them. And we haven't had a video yet this year, so someone get creative out there and send us a video. We always like those too. Yes. We might just have your answer, the solution to your problems. Okay. Bless you. Thank you. Um. This one is from Sandy R. Wilmington, Massachusetts. What do you do when you are not filming? Are you still working on cabins? You, yeah, there's always a cabin going these days. Yes. We try, to t- we try not to be, but it's, there's always cabins going. For the last two years? Yes. Three years. 
Two years. What time off? We um, ski. You ski? Yeah, you do family. You guys, you guys got a lot going on. Horses. I mean, your kids are right in there. Yep. Travel. Concerts. Concerts. Music. Dogs. Sports. Sports. Yeah, there's a lot to keep us busy. We love we we live in Maine. We love, we're outside a lot. Yeah, if we're not a, if we're not filming or working on cabins, we're at Saddleback Worldwide Headquarters. Worldwide Headquarters. Huh? We're always you're always t- tinkering on something. Yeah, we're always around. Cabin is how house is never done. Yeah, I just started a covered deck on the front of our place. Oh, where where at? Started he. Did some tape. Uh, Techno Metal Post <laughs> is set to come next week. Where we're at? at he moved which the rabbits. End? The door end. So not, he not, didn't tell me about this also. The far end where like the tree fell? Yeah. So right, so right, right where you got that it's, small deck there, it's going to wrap around and you can go in the side. To the other deck? To the side front porch. Or the front Past Rabbit porch. Alley? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Past <laughs> Rabbit Alley. <laughs> Interesting. That's a, I like that. He didn't yeah. tell me. What brought that up? Just what Sarah wanted it. Good smart man. <laughs> I remember walking to your house like what eight months ago, and I didn't know you guys redid the whole yeah. thing. That was a trip. Like walking's like, yeah. You know, there's a. It was supposed to be a, big changes. Yeah, big big changes. changes. And it all goes back to happy wife, happy Still life. Still hole in the floor. So I guess that's what we're doing. Oh, that's what I've been doing lately when I haven't been is working on the house, getting ready for winter. Why are you staring at me when you say that? Because you're going to be helping soon enough. No, it's winter. <laughs> you can ask questions. You can swing a hammer. <laughs> It's not. That's not true. Okay. Okay. Um. Here's another question. Yeah. Here's one more. We'll do a quick one. This is from Tim S. from Mobile, Alabama. Hi, Tim. You want to try that again? Nope. I forgot what A L stands for. Alabama. Um. There's a lot of A L states. Alaska. AK. Mobile. All right. That's no Jen one said Sarah. I was a geography. Jen's from that area. Do you know that? Not me. My family. No one said I was a geography whiz. Your family's from Alabama? My entire family's from Alabama. Really? Mobile, Alabama. Couldn't tell her by the lift of pickup truck she dies out <laughs> <laughs> All right. Would you guys consider taking your show on the road and coming to Alabama? Sure. This is a question from Let's Jen Reese's sh- father. <laughs> <laughs> is it really? I love it. Um, right no. now, we're not allowed to cross state lines, but someday. <laughs> someday. I'm pretty sure my family would have a project for you down there, though. I, I hate snake stuff. I would like. I think it'd be fun to do ch- challenges, like one in the bayou or something. I'd love it. Dad wants like, to move to Louisiana. Like how how far can you drive a techno See, post to a swamp? See, geography. Yeah. Right. I said it was in Louisiana. Oh, like like on the side of a Sometimes. mountain in Colorado, or, <laughs> yeah, it'd be fun. Someday, somewhere warm. No. Yes, but yes, we would be. We would consider. Wait, which show? The podcast or the main cabin masters? I'm assuming they're referring to main cabin masters. That's yeah. a lot more epic than um, I, the podcast. Like I've thought about taking it, you know, somewhere Worldwide. tropical, somewhere out of the country. Mm-hmm. But apparently, there's like Carne, which is this thing about shipping camera equipment. To other countries where every single thing has to be documented, signed in, like it's a major pain in the butt. So it's what if we just go there and live for a while? I, I think we're fine, but if we want to film it, it's tough. Or we just hire. So we some just countries hire, like tropical. Some countries crew. do carne, C A R N E. Others don't. All I can think of is a nice piece of Mexican beef right now. <laughs> Jeez, <laughs> carne oh asada. <laughs> but yes, I mean it would. We'd love to, but nope. Maybe someday. Maybe someday. Maybe like our last year, they'll be like, you're going to travel the world and go to five locations. Right. That'll be our, yeah. Well, will will you, Alabama be at the top of your list, though? Any, anything I'll within... I'll be honest with you. I wouldn't any, hate it. Anything within like four lines of the equator, is how that works? Like, yeah. You know. Fun trivia fact. Did you know that Mardi Gras originated in Mobile, Alabama? It did yeah. not originate in New Orleans. I oh. like boobs and beads. I'm in. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Quitting my job. Cut him off. <laughs> All right. right. I'm just <laughs> That's it for fan questions. Keep them coming. <laughs> and now we are on to some new merchandise that goes along with the whole theme of Fred the Afghan Dog. We've got antler chews. Not one of those, Mac. Gracie's Moose Antler Dog Chews. So my dogs 
don't like these for some reason. My dog doesn't either. Because my dogs are spoiled. But I've seen dogs go crazy so, for these. So originally, we we were offered to sell them. We said no because our dogs didn't like them. But we were so wrong because... So wrong. So many dogs Not the first time. to chew on them. Like, I don't know what it is. Why our dogs don't like it, but... I feel like we're supposed to be in the woods doing this right now. Where's the buck? It is that time of year. But yeah, they, do, dogs love these. Yes. And we have all sorts of... Mate, Kennebec Cabin Company furry friend paw bomb. What is that? I don't actually know. Paw bomb? Try it on. Is this really for dogs? Yeah. So you put it on dogs, like you can put it on in the winter so they don't get the ice balls like in their fur oh, on the cool. bottom. Or oh some my gosh, dogs will Kermit get um, needs that. like draw, dry pads. Yeah. And you can put it on to help like cracking pads. And it's oh. really, I actually used it and it worked really well. If it was snowy right now, I'd put some on my feet and run outside. But Kermit needs some of that. Yeah. So if you don't want your dog wearing booties. <laughs> yeah, but you it's, it's like pretty bad though. Yeah, stuff, yeah, yeah, you know? yeah. Same yeah. idea. And, huh. if you, and if your floors are clean, the dog comes in with all those ice balls you yeah. can't get out there. Like, There we go. You can, this stuff pays for itself. You can find this at KennebecCabinCompany.com. We've got everything under the sun. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> Our retail girls are doing a heck of a job. Like, yeah. Very proud of them. But it's, yeah, very cool. That's a good stocking stuffer, too. For, yeah, for the pets. Do you have stockings for your dogs? Of course uh, he does. You have yeah, gifts yeah, for yeah, your yeah, dogs. Who am I kidding? God, my, my, ice, <laughs> my dogs get ice cream crown. We have we have stockings for our pets for no, Otis don't. for Otis we have we have stockings for literally everyone True. that we ever have met before. How many rabbits? That's a lot. <laughs> oh yeah, Jonathan needs a stocking. <laughs> pets deserve stockings, and they All deserve right. to get stuffed from me. So these Kevin are a couple Kevin of products. Company. Time for so you think you know main trivia question. Last week's question. Okay, what island near Harpswell was overrun first by rats, then by cats? Uh, I'm going to say Coney. I'm just going to go Oars. Haskell Damn. Island. Which one's Haskell? I don't know. There's so many islands down there. <laughs> Haskell Island. Haskell Island. So, yeah. Be the first person to answer that and send your um, in, right Institute podcast. Wait, wasn't that last week's? Was yeah. that last week's So question, we, will let, we will let so the winner we, know. Yeah, yeah, so don't send us the answer. You're too late. Yeah, yeah. Whoever sent the right answer to podcast at me. Congratulations to whoever sent the right com. answer. You won a great prize. Now for the next question, if you know the answer. Send it to podcast at me, cabmasters.com. We'll choose the first correct answer. This week's question. Oh, that's not what I thought the answer was going to be. Um, who was the first governor to reside in the Blaine House? <laughs> Is it that obvious? Don't say anything. Fine. Yeah, we'll leave that one as is. But yeah, if you know the answer, submit it to podcast at meandcatmasters.com. And we want to thank Craig and Fred the Afghan for joining us today. That was pretty amazing. What a story, huh? What a story. Yeah. Do- uh, dogs make the world a better place. Absolutely. And that is living proof. So thank you again for joining us. Thank you to our sponsors, Nelma Hero Media Network. Hammond Lumber Company, Kennebec Savings Bank. Thank you, Maggie. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you, Chase. And From the Woodshed, we'll be talking to you. From the Woodshed has been brought to you by Nelma. See the stamp? Trust the quality. Hammond Lumber, your building project partner. Kennebec Savings Bank, helping our local community save, thrive, and grow for over 150 years. And Hero Media Network, connecting small business with new customers. From the Woodshed is a production of Kennebec Cabin Company. See you next time.